right now. So Hanley, thank you so much for being here today. So just to give a little bit of background, I'm Elizabeth. I'm from Extraordinary Journeys, um, a custom travel company offering unique experiences around the world. And I'm really excited today to have Hanley from I Am Water Conservation joining us today. Um, just to give you a little background, Hanley's an amazing person. Um, she, you are a record-breaking free diver from South Africa. I believe you broke 11 records um, in South Africa for your free diving. And if I remember correctly, you can hold your breath longer than some of the rugby team in South Africa, than most of the rugby team. Oh, all of them. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> so over six minutes, right? I mean, I can't even hold it for two, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, she's the founder of I Am Water Conservation. Um, it's an organization that works with underprivileged coastal communities uh, where a lot of young people have actually never even explored the ocean and they live right there. Many of them don't even know how to swim. So I think it's kind of a big part is to get the community involved in the conservation um, of the water that is just right there, right behind them. Um, in addition to an incredible work in the water, Hanley is a certified yoga instructor. Um, she's an incredible documentary filmmaker and we'll talk about it later and show some of her photos that she takes with her husband, Peter. And she's also a motivational speaker and she's talked at, you know, some incredible events at the World Economic Forum, Adidas, Condé Nast. I mean, that's just to name a few of them. So to give you some background, I met Hanley and her husband, Peter, at a travel conservation conference about four years ago. And right away, I was just totally attracted by their like positive energy. And I just wanted to hang out with them the whole time, which I did. Um, and I also, what I loved about it is, you know, we've always worked in the safari world and I was very aware of what was going on on land, but I never really thought about the ocean. And it just was a part of the world I was really ignoring. And Hanley really kind of opened that to me. And my first experience was actually right there. We were in Cape Town for this conference and she invited me to explore the kelp forest, which I'd never even heard of. And what's really fun is now um, with my octopus teacher, people do know about it and they've seen it on Netflix. But at the time, no one, I mean, I felt very privileged um, to experience it because no one, I never really thought about it. So I really, instead of just talking about it, actually, we have a video of my first experience going exploring the kelp forest with Hanley. So let me show that. Um, I found it in my um, in my video. So let me get that and show that with everyone. So here we go. This is my experience with Hanley and, and Peter in the ocean. Let me know if you can see the video. Can everyone see it? So that's me um, with her husband, Peter, getting ready to get into the water. Yep, that's me. <laughs> uh, and I've never free gone free diving before. So, um, and, and that's the kelp forest going down there for the first time. Um, yeah, I mean, I was just amazed. I didn't know all of this was right there. Um, I mean, just, it's incredible. Just right there in Cape Town. Looks like a James Bond scene, um, just getting out of tourist. <laughs> so that was um, so that was my experience with Hanley. So I'm back. Is it still sharing, or am I back online? Um, I'm back. So yeah. So Hanley, what I'm gonna do today, what I'd love is really, I just want to hear from you and get you to talk about your experience, um, kind of how you started in free diving, and then also how you started with your conservation work. And also everyone, um, we'll do a Q&A. So, you, you know, please feel free to like, as we're talking, uh, type in some questions in the Q&A section and we'll just read them as we go along. So Hanley, welcome. <laughs> Tell us more about yourself. <laughs> Thank you. It was so fun to see that little video from our kelp forest experience together. It really is such a joy always to invite people into the kelp forest in Cape Town. I mean, 
it's so crazy, right? Everyone comes to Cape Town for the wine and for the mountain and for the food. And you're like, come on, people, this is a city that happens to be a city. The ocean is the main attraction. So I feel very privileged that um, that's kind of become more of a common knowledge now after the success of my octopus teacher, even though it's something we've been saying for a really, really long time. So for my story didn't start close to the ocean. I grew up on a horse farm outside Pretoria inland in South Africa. But I think the great thing of growing up on a farm is that nature was very, very central to me and to my life from a very early age. So even though it wasn't the ocean, it was wilderness, it was finding wild spaces, it was finding a quiet in nature. And my dad was a horse whisperer. And um, long before it was a film or a book or anything, he just called it good horsemanship. <laughs> and so I think for me, that relationship with animals was something very important from a very early age. And then it was actually when I moved to Sweden to study, which still doesn't make any sense for free diving. I met a free diver there who invited me to go diving in a fjord and it was ice cold and my wetsuit didn't fit and like the conditions were terrible, but I took that one breath in and I dived down and it was just so quiet and so still and so intimate with nature in a way that that really became what I was longing for and wanting to go back for. And I was, I guess, lucky in that I showed a natural talent for freediving. And so it kind of pushed me towards competing, which wouldn't have naturally have been my, my choice because I'm not actually a naturally competitive person. I'm much more about an experience than an achievement. Um, but it kind of pulled me in because I was just so curious about what my body could do. And to explore that competition was a natural next step. Like how deep can I go? How long can I hold my breath? How far can I swim underwater? And for me, it was always about how fascinating it was for me to see my body as an aquatic animal. Our bodies have the same adaptation for being underwater as whales and dolphins and seals have. So I think my journey into free diving was really a journey into nature, not so much the competitive side of, of free diving, for sure. And it still is today. I don't compete anymore but I still dive deep and I still hold my breath for long. And I feel like I'm probably even better today than I was then because there's no pushing from the outside. It's all just internal motivation around um, the experiences that I can have. But today for me, it's much more about sharing it with others, Elizabeth, which is why that video makes me, makes me so happy because that's like my favorite thing. No, and it's interesting that you say that because I think so many people think of free diving as a competition and I think that's just kind of people get scared of it and they're afraid of doing it. But what I liked and the way you brought you made me comfortable with it, it was just really kind of a tool and a way to get closer um, to get comfortable in the water without all the equipment. So mm -hmm. I think it is nice to not, you know, I mean, would you say free diving is accessible to everyone? I mean, that was the feeling I got and you clearly brought other people um, in the ocean. So is that kind of a valid perception just to say, no, it's actually accessible to everyone. It doesn't have to be a competition. You don't have to have amazing, you know, be able to hold your breath for six minutes to be yeah. able to. Totally. And I think it's a really interesting thing, right? Because let's take, for example, rock climbing, right? You wouldn't off the bat, if I say to you, hey, Elizabeth, have you ever gone rock climbing? You wouldn't be, no, I'm a terrible rock climber because I've got awfully short arms. It's like, you never hear somebody say that, but I hear people say all the time, I can never do free diving. I have terrible lung volume. And it's a similar thing. It's like, how do you even know that? You know, I mean, I've trained asthmatics who've become incredible free divers. Like we have these preconceived ideas about our bodies and what we can do that are not based on fact like sure you haven't done it but that's fine you can learn so I think it's also something about once we become adults and we become experts in our fields whether it's something physical or mental or whatever our practice is we think that just because we're a beginner at something that we're bad at it Right. And I think that's a really important realization to make, to be like, I'm a beginner, that's great, I'm learning, but I can still do it. And the great thing with freediving is that there's really zero barrier to entry. I mean, even if you are just snorkeling, you're part of the environment, like in a place like a kelp forest or some of the places where we take guests, you know, that all the action, all the life, all the animals, everything's happening at the surface. So you hardly even have to go down. Going down is super fun and we can train you to do that, but you don't have to be really good at it to have the experience. 
And then as you build your confidence, the depth comes and the time comes. So there really is zero barrier to entry. Anyone, anyone can do it. Yeah, no, that was really the feeling I had. Um, and that was, mind you, I think I had an ear infection that day and I still <laughs> um, And then could you also kind of tell us how did you go from, you know, the free diving and now to marine conservation, which I believe now is kind of like the main purpose, you know, kind of what you do full time now, um, yeah. you know, being involved in that project. Absolutely. So. When I started freediving and getting into the competitive side, I was in my early 20s. And at that time, I was a documentary filmmaker. That was kind of my passion. I wanted to tell stories, um, social political stories of transformation and change. And so I was traveling over Africa, making films, and I enjoyed it. But then freediving became more and more central to my life. But I was still very passionate about these transformational stories of change and the social political side of the filmmaking I was doing. And then coming back to South Africa after like a decade of competing in freediving and filmmaking, this was when I was still living in Sweden. I traveled around in South Africa, um, actually on a film I was working on, and I was just appalled by how segregated ac access to nature and in particular to the ocean still was. I mean, South Africa, we have so much work still to do on access, right? Like, because of our apartheid past, beaches were whites only, public swimming pools were whites only. So the ability to swim, the ability to feel comfortable in nature was an elitist thing. And even though we were like almost 20 years into democracy, you know, just because you've changed a government doesn't mean you've changed a system. And so I saw all these communities like, you know, what we call townships in South Africa, but underserved coastal communities that are predominantly, you know, black South Africans living within walking distance to the ocean. And the majority of the kids can't swim. There's trans transgenerational fears of the ocean because of this lack of access. And I didn't see that many projects at the time that were really trying to bridge this gap. So I think for me, it was bringing together my two passions, my love of the ocean and wanting to share that with others and this social political drive of wanting to create access and opportunity for people in, in South Africa. And that was kind of what was the founding idea of I Am Water Ocean Conservation. And so I Am Water's passion is to see how we can create more opportunity for South Africans and then more access to the ocean for young people in South Africa. And today at I Am Water, we've trained over a hundred coaches, young people from the communities to work as coaches to sit to give this experience to children. And then we work with over 50 partner schools and growing where we work with whole grade seven classes and bring the grade seven classes to the beach from school. So they actually get out of school for two days and come and have an ocean guardians experience. And so that's kind of the, the flagship project of I Am Water is really to create physical experiences for youth in South African youth in the ocean. Wow, that's, that's really incredible. Um, and you've been doing this now, it's been quite a 10, how, how long have you been doing it? 10 years? This, is our, this is our 11th year. It 11th was year. Wow. founded in 2010. Congratulations. Um, and then what are, I know you've worked on quite a few campaigns as well, you know, to help, you know, to protect the ocean. Um, can you talk us some of the latest successes or the latest campaign um, you're working on right now? Yeah. Um, I think part of what I find really interesting is how we can advocate for change from a place of connection and hope. I think that's really important to me. So whenever I can, adding my voice to campaigns for, for change, um, some of the ones would be around, for example, having more marine protected areas proclaimed and seeing how we can get to this 30% by 2030, for example. Um, recently, it was around shifting travelers from experiencing cetaceans in captivity. So trying to stop, for example, a big player like Expedia selling tickets to captive dolphin shows. Um, that kind of, you know, I think it's really important to be quite specific sometimes when advocating. I think it can get quite general sometimes. And so I enjoy sometimes like really digging deep into the specifics and adding my voice to this kind of this kind of advocacy. But then in general, I get to do quite a lot of speaking engagements with corporations and thought leaders, you know, with World Economic Forum, that kind of thing, and also corporations where I think that um, 
it's important that we keep the topic of oceans on the table and do it in a way that people feel engaged and hopeful. You know, I think there's so much right now around what's happening um, with climate change and to, to the planet in general, that it's so easy to start feeling quite despondent. And I think what really gets me going is when we can tell the truth, but do it in a way that people's hearts remain open and hopeful. No, and that's a good point, because sometimes, you know, you read about the coral or, you know, dying and you just feel totally, absolutely help, you know, hopeless. And, and so it is nice to have a little bit of another message saying, you know, things, some places can get better, are getting better. And it's not just, don't just throw your hands up in the air. Exactly. Um, and I think with the wildlife, it's also, you know, we'd always work so hard at, against petting or touching animals and, you know, kind of continuing what you're saying with the ocean now doing the same thing there. So um, all, and very practical things to do for sure. Um, so then I want to do on that hopeful sign, you know, kind of the hopeful and beautiful part of it. You're an amazing, and you're and your husband actually, because I know Peter takes a lot of photos as well. Um, you work, you're a great team. Um, can you share some of those photos? Can you share some of that ocean for us and just kind of, you know, show us why it's so beautiful and, and, and why we're- Of course. Um, I have some here that are some of my favorites. I won't um, start at the very beginning because then <laughs> we'll be here. I'll be here all day and I don't know where everybody is in the world. So it's probably quite late in some places. So this here is from Cape Town. This is a Cape Fur Seal colony just outside of Hout Bay in Cape Town, where you've got thousands of seals who are very happy to come and play with you. And what I mentioned to you earlier with um, our bodies being that of, of, of animals, I always like to remind people of their mammalian dive response that when we are diving, we basically wake up our inner seal. We literally have the same adaptation to being underwater that these little critters have and that whales and dolphins have that our mammalian dive response gets activated when we free dive. So the first thing that happens when your face touches the water, your heart rate slows down, bradycardia. And then as you're holding your breath and your carbon dioxide levels go up, it triggers a response to um, vasoconstrict your blood vessels in your arms and legs so that you have a centralization of the oxygen in the body to feed the brain. And then finally, your spleen, which is what I like to call a low glory organ, because nobody really speaks about the spleen. Your spleen is a storage space of oxygen rich hemoglobin. And when we dive, our spleen can constrict and release this oxygen rich hemoglobin into the centralized bloodstream to give more oxygen to the brain as we're holding our breath. So these adaptations were first seen in elephant and Weddell seals. And then the research was done on, on the human body. And turns out we are the cousins of seals and whales and dolphins. So it's always fun looking at this kind of picture to be like, yep, I might have to wear a little bit of a wetsuit when it's 10 degrees Celsius in the water, but I'm not that different from you guys. You know, when I'm holding my breath, I'm, I'm also a seal. So this is, yeah, that's from Cape Town. And that always makes me happy to think of those guys being so on our doorstep. This is, and speaking of hope, Elizabeth, this photograph is for me one of those examples how travel can be a force for good. This is Emma, the tiger shark in the Bahamas. Oopsie, sorry, let's go back. Emma, the tiger shark in the Bahamas. And the whole of the Bahamas is a shark sanctuary. So it's illegal to fish out any species of shark in the Bahamas. And the reason for that is because so many travelers come to see them. So Emma, for example, has a price on her head and she's worth millions and millions of dollars alive. And this protects her and her beautiful fins from being fished and cut up for shark fin soup because she's worth so much more alive than dead. And I think that's an example where travel can be a force for good, that if we actually travel and we interact with these animals in a responsible way, it can encourage governments to protect these animals because it actually makes economical sense. And as much as I don't want to see the natural world in numbers, it is a huge, huge consideration for, for governments, especially in regions where um, where there is a need for income, you know, where, where communities are are um, you know needing to work so so Emma is a beacon of hope in being alive and living in a shark sanctuary in the Bahamas and then this is from one of my favorite places in the whole entire world you can just in the middle of all those fish you can see me disappearing into this tornado of jackfish and this photograph was taken in the Sea of Cortez um, in Mexico in Baja California um, and this tornado of fish you would struggle to find 
anywhere else in the world, this many fish. You can see it continuing down the bottom there, like down to 20 meters, there's this column of fish and it gets even bigger than this when all the different schools come together. How many are there? Oh gosh, good luck in counting. It is millions and yeah, it's a lot of, lot of fish. But the Sea of Cortez, I mean, Jacques Cousteau famously called it the aquarium of the world. And in Cabo Pulmo, um, just over 30 years ago, uh, a young fisherman called Mario said to his dad, if we keep fishing in this Sea of Cortez the way we do, there won't be any fish left. And Mario's dad, coming from generations of fishermen, said to him, that's crazy. There will always be fish in the sea. <laughs> and uh, Mario was like, I don't think so. We need to rethink how we fish. Um, so he actually went to um, Cabo San Lucas and he trained to be a scuba diving instructor and he brought two tourists back to his fishing village and they went out on a boat and they went diving and he came back and he said to his dad, I've got money in the hand, we didn't have to kill, kill a fish, we don't have to worry about what the market price is in La Paz, let's think about this and he slowly won over his dad and then he won over the rest of the village and Cabo Pulmo became this famous marine protected area which has now celebrated almost 30 years of protection. So this picture really is a testament to conservation and a testament to community conservation where Mario advocated for the fish and said, you know, we don't have to kill them to make a living. Um, it's a beautiful place to go and a beautiful story and one of our favorite destinations for taking clients and actually teaching freediving in this success story. And going out, when we go diving, we dive with Mario's diving company and his son, David, who's now 30 years old, is our skipper who takes us out. And he's literally driving the boat and he'll stop the boat and go, and I mean, you see nothing. It's just this blue ocean all around you. Like, why did we stop? And he'll go, I can smell them. We're here. <laughs> And you get in the water and you can't see anything at the surface and you get in the water and this is underneath you. So it really is wonderful to get to know these characters, you know, who fought for the wildlife and who you can still share this experience with. Um, yeah, so Cabo Pulmo and the Jackfish is one of my favorite places. So this is um, a group of sperm whales. I've had a few extraordinary experiences with whales um, around the world. And we love taking people to a very tiny island in the South Pacific to swim with humpback whales. Um, but sperm whales is one of those experiences that, you know, they're the biggest toothed animal ever to have been on the planet. They're highly intelligent and getting in the water with them is like getting in the water with, you know, a life form we haven't yet gotten to know. It's as close to an alien you can imagine because they feel smarter than us. We just can't communicate with them, but they can scan us and they can read our intentions. They can read our, if we have aggressions. And I had an experience with over 60 of these sperm whales where they scanned me and they allowed me to share time and space with them in the water before taking this big breath and diving down and they can dive down to, you know, up to three kilometers deep where they hunt giant squid. So it really is like you've, you know, stepped into a, into a, a story, you know. Um, wow. Yeah. It just made me very emotional. <laughs> yeah. No, it's incredible, you know, and, and it really also does, um, does remind you of, you know, the privilege of sharing time and space with such giant creatures and then realizing that we are the most powerful species on the planet. How did that happen? How can that be? And what is that responsibility that comes with that? So I think for me, being with the big animals is really a very big part of that, um, of that knowledge for me. And then this is a whale shark which of course is the biggest fish in the sea, um, a shark, not a whale, but has very, very tiny teeth. And one of the things I love talking about whale sharks is so many people, you know, they're such iconic when you look at them and the spots on their back that make them unique, like our fingerprint, but they're also completely mysterious. I mean, they're these giant fish who are solitary. They travel the world's oceans. They can travel like from sea to sea. And the females, this is one of my favorite crazy things about um about whale sharks is that they can have up to 300 live pups at a time inside of them and when they give birth they give birth to these perfectly shaped little spotted alive whale sharks but what scientists believe is that whale sharks can actually have pups at different stages of development inside them at any certain given time so you can have like 
fully grown pups that are about to be born and little tiny pups that are still growing. And then the whale shark can decide, okay, it's time to give birth to this lot, you know? I mean, it's just <laughs> unbelievable, which then of course means that she is getting impregnated at different times as she's traveling through the ocean. I mean, it's mysterious, completely mysterious. So yeah, whale sharks are one of my favorites purely because they like so incredibly big that they just blow your mind. But then also like there's so much we don't know about them. I've got friends, marine biologists who've been, you know, swimming with the very large pregnant females in the Galapagos with ultrasound machines trying to like see what's going on inside of them. So, you know, one day when I feel like I need a next challenge, that could be something to use. <laughs> to go and be a whale shark midwife in the Galapagos. Um, and that's another one of our favorites is going to Madagascar and, and teaching free diving in this incredible channel where there's a huge congregation of, of whale sharks in the, in the final quarter of the year every year. And it's such a hot spot for whale sharks. And we still don't really know why, but it's one of those incredible places where on one day we saw up to 15, 20 different individuals. You're just like jumping in and out the water and there's just whale sharks everywhere. It's incredible. And the challenge of course, with all these big animal interactions is to find a place where you can do it without having a negative impact on the well-being on the, of the animals. And then if you take it one step further, it's where can I go that my presence will have a positive impact? on this animal and the communities who live on the shores of this ocean. And so that's for us at, at I'm Water Ocean Travel, that's really one of our guiding principles is that it's not, we don't want to just leave things the way they are, is how can we also make it better? So that's actually gonna be my next question. And if you could just share, you know, so Hanley has a foundation that, uh, what's really exciting is you can go with Hanley on some of these trips um, with Hanley and Peter, and you can also, um, now we're working on some options where you could just do one or two days in Cape Town with some people on your team. So can you kind of tell us um, some of the destinations where you're taking people? I know you have a, a daughter now, so you can't travel as freely, <laughs> no pun intended, um, as you did before. But yeah, if you can kind of, um, cause you know, there are a lot of people who, who love to travel on this, um, who are listening today. And, and if you can kind of tell them where to travel and how to experience this. Yeah, so the, the whole, um, how Peter and I started I'm Water Ocean Travel was really this kind of very, very slow, penny dropping. Often during my talks, I would show these kind of images because Peter and I would be invited on expeditions and we'd get these photographs and, and um, you know, people would say, oh, I want to do that. I want to swim with a whale shark. I want to swim with a sperm whale. I want to, you know, and I'd always preface my aunts and they say, where should I go? And I'd be like, well, don't go here. Don't go there because they feed the whale sharks there. There's too many boats in the water here. There's, you know, harassing of baby whales there. Like, don't go here, don't go there. And then eventually, Peter and I, like, we have the answer of where to go. So we're like, why don't we just take people there? And <laughs> why don't we just, you know, start running these trips also as fundraisers for the foundation. And so we started doing that and really like benchmarking, well, if we're going to take people to these pristine places, how do we do that in the best way? So it's around, you know, making sure that um, we travel sustainably, where we're staying, who the boat operator is we work with, like how well regulated is the interaction with the animals so that there's not too many boats crowding their space. Um, how no, I, much... don't know what was My lawyer is looking at the, the lawyer. I think somebody might want to mute their microphone. <laughs> anyway, and so it's this real like um, digging deep into seeing which places work. So for us, we take people to swim with wild dolphins in southern Mozambique, where there's very good regulation of the of the dolphin access. There's only three operators with permits. And there's also a lot of job creation for the local community. Madagascar for the whale sharks, Mexico for those giant schools of fish. And there's also whale sharks in the Sea of Cortez. And then um, Cape Town for the kelp forest. And then a tiny, tiny, very difficult to access island in the South Pacific um for the humpback whales which is i think for me really important because a lot of people go to some of the island groups in the south pacific where there's just too much pressure on the on the humpback whales so there are those few places in the world where the regulation serves the animals and the local community and that's kind of where we then 
take um, take our guests to to experience the ocean. And what you were saying earlier, Elizabeth, with Ava, this photo here—that's our little daughter. Well, this isn't our little daughter. But <laughs> I was like, this is me. <laughs> My daughter's a dolphin. No, this is me <laughs> diving down. And these dolphins are in southern Mozambique. And I've been going, this photo is from about three years ago. I've been going to swim with these dolphins for over 10 years. And you know, dolphins are so family oriented. It's a matriarchal society. It's all about like the moms and the grandmothers hold all the information and knowledge and pregnancy is very revered. Dolphins take very good care of their um, pregnant mamas. And so, yeah, I've been swimming with these dolphins. They know me, they know me well. There's like, you know, over 300 in different pods that move up and down the coast of Southern Mozambique. So it was my dream to, to swim with them while pregnant, knowing that they enjoy pregnancy, but also what's incredible, and this photograph is of me seven months pregnant in Mozambique, is that dolphins can actually, with their echolocation, they can scan and see the baby inside. So they can actually come up and do their little clicking and scanning and see the baby. So for me, this was a really special experience because the first people who really got to see the baby was uh, dolphins. And they name everybody they meet. So her first name was definitely a dolphin name, not the name <laughs> we gave her. And this little video will show you a little bit of just how curious they were to come around. You can hear that whistling and clicking. And um, there's actually a little one here in this pod. There's a baby here. And this baby was just, just couldn't get close enough to me. It was just like, who is in there? What's going on? Look at it. Standing and clicking and coming closer. So neat. <laughs> Where was this in Mozambique? Um, this was uh, north of Ponta Malangan, hmm. southern Mozambique. Yeah. Yeah. So these these dolphins are just phenomenal. You know, they're they're so intelligent, they're so playful and intuitive. So I think, you know, even though things obviously will change for us traveling with our daughter. My, my wish is really to give her a lot of these experiences and figure out how we can keep doing this, um, even, even with the little one, or particularly with, with the little one. She actually, while I was pregnant with her, she swam with humpback whales, whale shark, sharks, wow. dolphins. So now that she's uh, just over a year, we have to start it, you know, like in her own little, in her own little body. So I yeah, mean, I think- say that this is for everyone you know I mean all ages clearly should be able to do this so totally. people do not feel afraid it is open to everyone even the young ones <laughs> absolutely absolutely and I think you know like the work we do with iron waters I, I guess for, for me my passion really lies in that you know, this coming together of all these different ways of helping people fall in love with the ocean so whether it's to iron water ocean travel um sharing the experience on the oceans with our with our paying guests which funds the foundation which shares the ocean experience with the underserved youth and all the way to you know the talks i do getting to do it you know in front of a big corporation who might not have considered the ocean yet in their decision making processes so all of these things kind of come together in um how can we help people to fall in love with the ocean because that old saying you protect what you love really just is the truth and we can't expect people to care about something if they haven't even experienced it because then it's just information you know you have to take it from being information to being emotion and i think getting in the ocean does that nobody is um nobody's you know oblivious to to the ocean like there's either fear or there's love or there's curiosity and if we can overcome the fear and build the love then we're winning no absolutely and and i think so anyone you know who is curious and would like to to know how to do this um you know we we work with peter and hanley um we can incorporate it so easily and that's what i love is like yes you can do these longer trips and you can go to mozambique and and go to Baja and all that can be organized, but it can be as simple as just one day, just what yeah. I did myself in the kelp forest and just knowing about 
that's just an experience right there. And it's right there in Cape Town. And you always look at the ocean when you're in Cape Town. It's such a part of the city. So, you know, mm-hmm. we'd love, you know, if anyone's interested or, you know, on listening today, you know, just please let us know if you're, you know, if you're going to Cape Town and you want to add a day. Um, it can be, you know, if, if Hanley and Peter aren't there, it could be someone else from I Am Water to kind of show you around. So mm-hmm. a lot of different ways to experience it. And if they are there, you know, it's also an experience to go with, with you. I mean, it is a, a really, really amazing experience. Mm, absolutely. So, so I just want to open it up a little bit. Um, if anyone has questions, I know we kind of also, um, yeah, just like some Q and A's, um, feel free, free to kind of chat someone. Yeah, I saw um, here that Kim was asking if there's land activities you can do when visiting I'm Water. Absolutely. You know, I think what's wonderful is, you know, if you, if, if Elizabeth and the team build a really great experience that you can have in Cape Town, because there's so many land activities to be had. And then from our side, we can facilitate the ocean experience. And I think one can really have a holistic experience of Cape Town where you are experiencing 50%, not just the 50% on land, but also the the water experiences because the land stuff is so accessible and well-documented. But I think with the ocean stuff, it's super easy and accessible, but you want to have the right guide and the right kind of person to to lead you into it. And we we love doing that. Yeah, and also, and what's nice too, just if anyone's wondering, like you have like all the equipment there, you know, it is cold in the ocean. I'm not gonna lie, it was a little cold, but once you have the wetsuit and everything, I mean, you're all set, so. Absolutely, Absolutely. because there is a difference between, you know, it being cold, and you being cold, <laughs> you know, right. like the equipment can keep you warm. I mean, if you've seen my octopus teacher, um, I know Craig, Craig's a good friend of mine, you know, and he really does love swimming without um, without a wetsuit on. And for him, he feels like he's having a more intimate experience with the ocean. But, you know, once you're cold, there's no intimacy, you're just freezing. So I think like the equipment can totally be a, a guide, a help to to spending time in the ocean so don't think you have to be like super hardcore and you know mm-hmm. yeah you don't you don't you can you can um, you can enjoy every moment of it and you can look like a james Bond character like i did in the movie yeah <laughs> <laughs> that that's standard that's standard. yeah i mean yeah. it's always surprising because when people see you coming out of the water there like i felt everyone was like where did you guys come from <laughs> yeah exactly Exactly. So yes, you can do it from any hotel in Cape Town. The great thing with Cape Town is that it's, you know, like I'm actually in, in Los Angeles at the moment. We're here visiting some of Peter's um, friends and family. He's he's American. And so nobody the side has met Ava. So I'm actually in LA and I'm so reminded of here in LA. It's like, oh my God, it feels like a whole other country to just get from one side of the city to the other. Luckily, Cape Town's not like that. So it doesn't matter where you're staying, you'll be able to get to wherever the dive is within half an hour to 45 minutes. So it's not a big deal. Of course, to maximize your days, it's better to stay closer to the dive sites, but it's not a, it's not a requirement for sure. Certain time of year that's based in the kelp forest, it's an interesting one because summer is obviously light, lovely because then it's warmer in the in the temperatures in the air but at the same time we have the southeaster blowing then so you'd have to be very careful with which side and where you can always get in the water but then sometimes we have to go on the atlantic side or sometimes on the false bay side so we find where it's best on the day and then what i've realized through through these lockdown experiences we we live in Cork Bay and we have a view of the ocean and we've had you know two years now of being being home through march april may june and it's just beautiful. Every day is just beautiful. And usually we're traveling this time of the year. And it's been incredible. Of course, there's a couple of days of rain coming through and so on, which we need in Cape Town. But every day we wake and we're like, why are we always traveling during this time of the year? This is magical. So I think, you know, the best time to get in the water is when you're in Cape Town. And it doesn't matter when, we'll make it work. Even if it's freezing. Well, I guess it's never freezing. It's just a little cold. But you yeah, know. exactly. Exactly. It just means that you also have to have hot tea when you get out and the hot rain, the warm and you had, And when I did it, you actually had um, hot water ready. Yeah. So I remember we, we went in and then you had like hot water. I don't know where it came from, but it was there. And so it was like. Peter, not- Peter packed it. Peter's a big yeah. fan of the hot water after the dive. And we'll be doing that well as well. It's wonderful. You like pour it over you and then you pour it into your wetsuit and it feels like a hug. It's amazing. It was fantastic. It definitely yeah. made it <laughs> quite yeah. nice. A few questions. Um, Jamie has a question. 
Um, a limit on how, okay, what are the immediate steps we can take to have positive impact on the world's oceans? Yeah, the, the interesting thing is whether or not you live close to the ocean, you need the ocean to survive and your, act, your actions affect the ocean. You know, more than 50% of the oxygen we breathe comes to the ocean. So even if you, from the ocean, so even if you're living inland, if you like breathing <laughs> more than 50% of the time, then you do need the ocean. And our every action affects it, you know, because climate change is such a huge risk for the sea and how it would change the actual acidity of the ocean and make the ocean an inhospitable place for life, which is not a good thing. Um, everything we know affects climate change, affects the ocean. So that obviously, you know, comes down to how we, yeah, how we think of our, our actions with regards to you know, fossil fuels and just consumption, what we consume. I'm a big fan of avoiding fast fashion, for example, you know, and then the obvious ones, I think everybody always thinks of plastic pollution, but to me, that's um, almost like the lowest hanging fruit. I think if you really want to start thinking about it, then you start, it starts infiltrating all your actions. And for me, one of the ones closest to my heart is how we eat the ocean, you know, what seafood we eat, how much of it we eat, how it's been fished, you know, we harvesting the ocean as if it's this limitless supply and it really isn't. So overfishing is, is one of my, you know, the challenges closest to my heart. I haven't eaten a, a fish in over 10 years. So I think it's just um, a very specific, you can just get very specific on how you eat our wild fish friends. And then if you're going to eat farmed fish, remember that some farmed fish takes eight kilograms of wild fish to farm a kilogram of farmed fish. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, um, you want to do a bit of research and then pick which other battles you committed to. I think that would be the, the best one. Um, yeah, fishing over fishing. Yes, there we go. Thanks, Jamie. That was my stance on seafood consumption. <laughs> uh, limits on how many people can go out on a dive at once. Um, when we hosting you together with our Iron Water team, we really can, can host a group because we have a team of, you know, a lot of coaches who are highly trained. So we'd be able to really facilitate that experience when we work with the kids, which obviously isn't 100% comparable, but we have highly trained coaches to do that because to work with a 12 year old who can't swim is sometimes harder than to work with, you know, a 35 year old who's just trying something for the first time. Um, so there really isn't a limit on, on how many people can go at once. It just, um, we'll just do the logistics. Oh, uh, perfect. Um, so yeah, because I think we did a group of 30 once of kids um, that you hosted in, in, in Cape Town. So that's right. That's right. I mean, if we have a couple of minutes, let me quickly share with you what that looks like. Hold yeah, on. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Have a quick look. This is what our Ocean Guardians workshop in, um, in Cape Town looks like. Here we go. And they can't fall in love with it. Wait. And go. My motor's vision is to connect coastal communities to the ocean so they can fall in love with it and that's protected. I'm feeling totally nervous today. I'm scared of the water. <laughs> On our Ocean Guardians workshops, we have grade seven students from local schools come to the beach and learn about their oceans. The workshop consists of two days. The first day, the experiences are had at a beautiful local tidal pool. On the second day, we bring them to one of our incredible pristine marine protected area beaches. These ocean conservation workshops are important to the kids in our community. Some of them don't really come out of good homes. Some of them can't even swim. So to bring them out a little bit of the comfort zone gives them that confidence to show them that they can actually do anything that they want to do. The Ocean Guardians workshops have three stations. We do rocky shores, exploration, a beach cleanup, and a snorkel station. Our goal is that whoever was afraid, whoever had that fear, comes out with love and want to teach more people that everyone can overcome this fear. It was the first time for me to snorkel. The ladies spent more time with me. Now I know how to float. I absolutely want to do it again. We had a lovely time and, and the sea will come on you did not get far. But I did love it. And thank you for everything. Yeah, I must say. 
<laughs> watching that reminds me why we do what we do, you know, like, I promise you, seeing a child open their eyes underwater for the first time and see that fear turn into like, you know, it's mine also, it doesn't just belong to the few, gosh, that is worth so much more than any record. <laughs> I, it, it does bring so much, you know, tears to your eyes. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, and so, you know, we're, I think we're, you know, we're going to wrap up, but I am going to follow up, you know, if anyone does want to, you know, um, donate, you know, I'm sure donations are always welcome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, especially I, I'm sure during COVID, I mean, I, I don't know how things were for you, but you know, mm -hmm. I think the ocean was closed for a while. People couldn't even yeah. go to the beach. So I'm sure that had an impact on the yeah. project. Yeah. Yeah, it was a challenge, you know, our, our first thing was how can we continue to take care of our coaches because of our um, coaching staff that's over 50 people, um, we phoned every single one of them at the beginning of COVID and over 35 of them said if I don't work with I'm Water on the workshops, um, my family won't have an income, that they are the, 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 the main breadwinners in their families. So we, you know, we really, we spoke to all our supporters and made sure that we could continue paying stipends to our coaches. And then we started doing um, Zooms into the schools when the schools went back so that the kids can continue getting some ocean learning, even though they weren't allowed to come out to the beach. Yeah, so there was a lot of, and, and we used the time to actually start creating a, an online curriculum. So we've um, we filmed and created an online curriculum that the schools can use, the inland schools can use to teach um, ocean literacy in the schools. So yeah, COVID was definitely a challenge, but it was also, I think, that opportunity to go, okay, how can we be even more um, creative with our with our resources. But you know, for anybody who's been in the nonprofit world, it is constantly like being in startup here. So any fiscal support is always appreciated. Um, yes. And we put it to good use and you'll see lots of ocean smiles when you come visit us. Yeah, so we'll definitely, we'll share that information with everyone. And again, anyone who wants to experience it firsthand. Honestly, like I encourage everyone, we can do it. Like we, it's just a day, it could be two days, but it really is life-changing. Um, so we really hope this got you excited. We're so happy everyone could join us today. And Hanley, welcome to LA, I guess. And I <laughs> Thanks. swim in the oceans out there. I don't know what you'll, I don't know if you've been in the water yet since you've arrived. But, um, I have a jet. I have a jet. But thanks everyone for joining. It really is great, Elizabeth, to know that, you know, I think that's also we're so united in this thinking that travel can be a force for good, you know. And as you know, when you were when you were asking Jamie about what are the things we can do to help the ocean, it really is in all our decisions. It's it's from how we travel to how we eat to how we shop to how we think and all of that. And and I think travel really can be a, a powerful force for good and to brainstorm how we can do that. So it's always fun to connect with the extraordinary journeys team because one feels like you know we're part of a bigger family of like-minded people. So. Thanks for hosting this and um, for chatting about our work. And I really hope to see all of you guys in the water sometime. Absolutely. We can't wait. So we, we're, we're starting to travel and we can't wait. So we'll definitely be yeah. there. And again, thank you so much for, you know, everything you're doing and everything um, you've done so far. So we're, we're very thankful and we'll continue supporting. Wonderful. Wonderful. And thanks, Nina. I just saw your comment that this would have been something you'd been afraid of. And Good. I'm so happy to hear that we've um, we've ticked that box because it really isn't something scary. It's just an amazing opportunity to have another experience of nature, which is really what it's all about. And if it's something COVID's taught us, it's that we need nature. You know, when we can't go out our doors, so whew, something's taken away from you. You realize how valuable it is. So definitely, yeah. right. definitely um, look forward to seeing all of you in the water. Thanks so much for this, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Take care.